Hi, welcome again. Uh, in our next episode, we have Alex um, Skidanov uh, from NIR, uh, who's going to you know, uh, tell us about uh, the details of his design. Um, and as kind of framing for the discussion, uh, my understanding is that NIR basically used EVE 2 as a starting point, at least a, a design from maybe a year ago or a year and a half ago. Well, some aspects of it, definitely. Yeah, some aspects of it. Um, and you've kind of forked off. So it would be interesting to see what, what the key differences are between uh, EVE 2 uh, yeah. and NIR. Yep, let's dive in. Cool. So uh, one of the things that I've prepared is, um, just to provide some, some grounding, is some of the design decisions in, in EVE 2. Um, and yeah, it would be good as, as we uh, talk about this, like fill in the, the table for now. Yep. Yeah. Um, so so before, before we do that, do, do you want me like to briefly talk about Nightshade so that when we use terms as we go through that? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. I mean, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so, so the biggest forking point uh, between Nier and, uh, well, I, I call them more classic charging designs. Uh, so Ethereum uses, uh, so the, the more classic charging designs, they have shard chains. Uh, where every shard chain is effectively, to an extent, is an independent blockchain, right? So there are multiple shard chains. Um, uh, and, the, and there is a single chain, uh, which is, uh, we will refer to it as beacon chain, that's an Ethereum term. Uh, there's a single chain, uh, which has, first of all, significantly higher security uh, than, than all the remaining chains. So everybody, or like a very large percentage of participants validates beacon chain, and only a sample validates every shard chain. Uh, and so beacon chain is responsible for many things. One of them is generating unbiasable randomness. Uh, and some others would be uh, some way of uh, improving security of every shard chain. So for example, one common way of doing, uh, one common thing that exists in many such protocols uh, is for, uh, for shard chains to respect the last block that is known to the beacon chain. So if beacon chain acknowledged in some way that it saw this block, and the shard chain will never build on top of anything that, that is not this block. So that's one of the things that beacon chain might be doing. Uh, so instead, what we do in near, which is uh, we, we took a step to simplify this process. Uh, so specifically, the problem is that when you, when you need to orchestrate multiple chains, uh, the, the implementation becomes pretty complex, right? You need to maintain each, each chain to an extent has its own fork schedule, its own consensus. Uh, and uh, orchestrating all of that becomes, uh, designing it, thinking about it becomes more complex. So in near instead, there's only one chain, uh, which we, uh, we call it the main chain. We can also call it the nightshade chain. And this entire design is, is called nightshade. And so what happens is uh, in this main chain, uh, every block, so, so it has a header uh, with a pretty standard things like previous block or a global state root, et cetera. And logically, but not physically, uh, this block will also contain all the transactions uh, that happened from the previous block. However, physically, what will actually happen is uh, similar, similar uh, to other sharding designs, the state uh, is logically split into multiple shards. So for example, we can think of the entire state as, as a con uh, continuous set of account IDs, uh, which is split at some boundaries into, let's say, four shards. Uh, and so any, any transaction uh, that touches a particular shard, so all the transactions that touch the shard one, they will, log they will physically uh, be grouped into a thing called chunk uh, for shard one. Uh, all the transactions that touch shard two will, will, will logically be uh, grouped into chunk two, et cetera. Uh, and so even though logically the block contains all those transactions, physically people will only download the block and the block contains the headers of the chunks, but then they will only download chunks for the shards they actually care about. Uh, and so, uh, every, every block contains at most one chunk for a particular shard, but it could contain zero, for example, if the chunk producer failed to produce it, uh, or if it, it wasn't sent in time. Uh, and so you can think of those chunks as, uh, uh, those chunks, uh, they closely resemble uh, the shard chain, right? So the chunk builds on top of the previous chunk, and it builds on top of the state that the previous chunk uh, w was the result of applying transactions in the previous chunk. Uh, but, but it becomes simpler in many other aspects for example, there's only one fork choice rule now. There's only one concept of finality. There's only one consensus running here. Uh, and it also simplifies to an extent the way, <coughs> uh, obviously now, uh, same as with the uh, short chains design, 
uh, the concept of cross-shard transactions appears, right? If, if a transaction previously in a non-sharded chain would have touched accounts into different shards, now it has to be executed separately in every shard, and so, so the, the, sh the shards need to communicate. So that also becomes simpler to an extent. Uh, and so let's see, let's see how it fits into the uh, table, and then if something is not covered with this uh, particular uh, separation, we, we can cover it later. So I have a few questions here. So mm -hmm. are you saying that you have uh, chunk producers and then block producers? Right, so the way it works is that there's a single set of block producers. Uh, so let's say in, in, in our design, that number today is between 100 and 200. So if okay. it's more than 200, uh, the system as built today uh, will not necessarily be able to handle it. So the 200 block producers, uh, they take turns producing blocks, yep. right? Uh, and then they also, each of them is assigned to some subset of shards, right? Uh, and so within those shards, they also take turns producing chunks. Okay. Right, so you could think about it like every, f like let's say five of, the first five are assigned to maintain the first five shards, and then the next five How are assigned to maintain. How many shards do you have? Uh, we're probably going to launch with something very small, like eight. Uh, okay. But like up to, up to 100 uh, today will probably be handleable. Oh, oh the green one doesn't work. Orange. OK, so you have, you have eight shards. Mm -hmm. uh, we have 64. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and so, so part of the idea here is that we want to launch something that, that is meaningful today, right? right. So today, especially given like, uh, the, like it will take time for, for the wider adoption, so eight shard will be more than sufficient. Mm -hmm. uh, and the idea is that once it is shipped and it is operational, uh, then we can do, so, so number of shards we can just do an upgrade and, and increase up to 100. Right. Uh, but also increasing like beyond 200 validators or beyond block producers or beyond 200 shards, we, we, can, we can be uh, building the tech to support that as, as the system already is operational and, uh, okay. uh, and the adoption is already so going. for us, yeah. the minimum stake is, is 32 ETH. So if mm -hmm. you look at the kind of max number of validators, then we get, <coughs> uh, we get about 4 million validators. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's like if you divide the right. total. Yeah. And for you, y are you saying that the max number of validators is around 200? Right. Uh, and so instead of having the, the maximum, uh, the specific stake, what happens is uh, everyone in the system can stake any amount at any point. Right, right. so you, can, you, you just go and you, you issue a staking transaction and you just say how much you want to stake, right. and that amount gets locked. Right. Uh, and what happens is that at the beginning of every epoch, and epoch is approximately half a day, mm -hmm. at the beginning of every epoch, we find such a threshold that if you divide every stake by that threshold, uh, then you get at least 200 uh, full seats, right? But, but any, any higher threshold will, will yield less than 200, right? And so that will be the, 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 the price of a single seat. Right, so for example, if I stake 100, you stake 50, and we need three seats total, it will say, well, threshold is 50, because if I divide by 50, I will get two seats and you get one. Mm -hmm. But if we would divide by 51, I would get one, you would get zero, and so we don't have right. enough. And like staking is purely optional, right? It's, and there's no like delegation. Uh, so we actually do build delegation. Yeah, uh, delegation. The, we, at least I personally am extremely against delegation. Okay. How, <laughs> however, however, what will happen if we don't, if we don't support delegation, people will still delegate with the idea that A, not everybody wants to run a validator or like blo block producing node. And B, many people will be uncomfortable running their own infrastructure because there's a high chance of messing it up and getting slashed. So right. people will delegate, they will just do it off chain. They will just go to one of the professional validators who exist today and they will just transfer them money and do like a paper contract, which is a perfectly viable solution. But now the system doesn't have, uh, now it becomes non-transparent. So we, we, we have no insight into how uh, how bad it is actually. Well, mm -hmm. if delegation exists on chain, we have we have very clear picture of how much is actually delegated. We we see the extent of the of the disaster. Right. Right. So delegation will be supported on the. Yeah. And the delegation is it um, that you can get slashed if if you delegate yes. your stake to someone else? Yes. Yeah. If someone else to whom you delegated made, committed a slashable act, you, you get slashed. Okay. Great. Um, and like, how do you split the rewards? Is that so, so the reward is um, effectively at the end of the epoch, uh, the total reward is just split. I think it's either equally with everybody or proportional to the number of blocks, pr blocks produced. Uh, but yeah, it, it happens at the end of the epoch. Okay, but I guess the, the splitting between 
the delegatee and the delegator. Oh, so, so that is interesting. So what happens is uh, staking happens to a smart contract. So every uh, delegatee, I guess, wh whomever is actually running the validator, right. they have a smart contract which outlines all the rules of how exactly the stake will be distributed. So in the simplest form, it will say, I will just give you 80% back of, of the reward proportional to, to your stake, but it could be arbitrary smart contract, which will distribute the reward back. Oh, that's cool. So you kind of have delegation abstraction. Yes. So the reason for that is that one of the big Cosmos validators today has 0% uh, or like 100% fee, and then off chain, they distribute reward according to some custom rule. Oh. So, so it's sort of, so because it's already happening in practice, right? It, it, it makes sense to, to automate it. Okay, great. Um, and what do you think in practice will be like the minimum like amount of value that you need to have one seat in the yeah. system? So, so I think if we figure out the percentage of, of total stake, right. th that can easily be derived, right? So if it's right. like, let's say total stake is 30%, is then 30% over 200 will be the cost of a single seat. It's, har it's hard to estimate right. the, the percentage, right? Uh, so, so for example, I don't have my own estimate, Ilya, my, the other uh, near co-founder, he thinks it's going to be over 50% total stake, at least initially, especially given that many uh, of the initial near holders, their tokens are locked, meaning that they can stake, but they cannot transfer them. Oh, so right. staking is the only thing they can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so it's good. Like think of it like, let's say 60% is locked. So that means 0.3% is right. the minimum stake mm -hmm. for the seed. Uh, if you have less than that, you can, you can run, uh, you can still run a node. It mm -hmm. will not be just immediately returned to you. You, you, can, you can claim it back. Right. Uh, but the idea is that if you want to be a fisherman, uh, you need at least some stake. So, so that we can, we can you need to, we need to be able to slash you if you submit an invalid challenge. So right. you can run a fisherman and there's no reward for the fisherman. Mm -hmm. So fisherman is entirely, you, it's voluntarily act. Uh, reasons for that is that it's actually very hard to, to, to create fisherman reward in such a way that whomever includes your transaction just doesn't steal your challenge. Like you need to do some commit reveal right. of some sort. Mm -hmm. And so instead of that, we're just saying there are clearly entities who will be willing to run fishermen like ourselves right. or like hypothetical exchange that is running near and has a large stake in it. So there are, there's plenty of entities who will voluntarily run fishermen. Right. Uh, and then Nightshade has this concept of hidden validators, which we don't ship initially, uh, but it's going to be like in one of the fu future updates, which provides you an extra layer of certainty that even if you don't trust there is a fisherman, mm -hmm. uh, there will be someone assigned to validate the shard who, who is not known to the system. Uh, and so you get an extra level. We, we can dive deeper in, into it later. Okay. Um, so I guess I have a couple of questions. One is, um, you know, you mentioned the, the roadmap that some features are coming mm -hmm. later. Right. Like we have phase zero, phase one, phase two. Mm -hmm. What is your deployment roadmap? Right. So, so I think ours is way uh, shorter. So, uh -huh. so there's there's initial mainnet, yes, uh, which will be launched. Uh, I, I cannot I cannot provide an exact <laughs> date. It, it, it depends a lot on stability, right? right? How much it will take until we actually certain that it will not go it down. It will launch in 2019, right? Uh, it, it will not <laughs> happen in 2019 anymore for sure. Okay, <laughs> that, that would be. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, and so there are two big features that's not going to be included. Uh, it's an uh, unbiasable randomness beacon. Okay, uh, which yeah. we have actually built, like it's on GitHub, right. uh, but stabilizing it will take longer than we're mm -hmm. comfortable yeah. delaying the, the launch. Uh, and hidden validators. So those are two big features. Yeah. And hidden validators aren't even started yet, right? Uh, but besides that, uh, there is sort of long tail of things such as we do need to scale beyond 200 validators right. uh, at some point. Right. Early on, it doesn't matter because we, we're not going to have enough. Like the number of total mm -hmm. professional people who run validators today is like in right. low hundreds. Right, so everybody who wants to run clearly will be able to, uh, but long term it needs to scale. Yeah. So this this max number of validators two hundred. That's like a technical restriction. It's not an economic one. Yeah. So two hundred today is beyond two hundred. We like we will not have the block production time, for example, that we want to have. Okay. Yeah. What is the block production time? Uh, we wish to have one second at some point. Okay. So today it it is not there. Yeah. Uh, but we we can we can sort of draw the timeline of how messages pass. Uh, and according to the timeline, one second is technically possible. Right. Uh, today, uh, it's somewhere between two and three seconds is what we can push. Okay. Yeah, but like once we once we dive deeper into Doomslug and Nightshade, like we can just draw the timeline of how messages travel for the block to be produced. Right. And effectively, what it boils down to is it needs to have uh, two round trips uh, between most of the validators and and validating transactions, which is. Two round trips. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, which I, is which is like round trip between China and the United States is 300 milliseconds. So without gossip network, yeah. without gossip network, that that would fit. With gossip right. network, it becomes more challenging. Yeah. Okay, interesting. And how how does your system degrade if latency becomes very high? So what happens is so so that's doom slug. Right. Uh, I, I can also cover doom slug quickly so okay. that we have Go all ahead, the all please. the building blocks. Yeah. Uh, so doom slug is this nice. Uh, so doom slug is a very new thing, right? So the the, the initial doom slug we published on the last day of the previous decade, so okay. a month ago. <laughs> uh, and so Doomslug is this very nice, very simple construction, which is uh, when you produce blocks, right? So, so I think this is sort of similar to, to Ethereum and many other systems. Uh, blocks include approvals, right? Or like some sort of- Include what, sorry? Approvals or like some approvals, sort of messages yes. from all other block producers, right? Yeah. So that's something that would be used for finality gadgets, et cetera. We call them attestations. You could yeah. call them votes. Yeah, we, we can call them, we call them approvals. Okay. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's all the same thing. You yeah. know, like it's a message from all other, every other block producer and or validator attesting to something in the past. Right. It could be, it could be the previous block, it could be something else. So specifically for Doomslug, uh, when you create a block, uh, to create a block you need, uh, you need this approval uh, from 50% of the remaining block producers on the very previous block. So that's one round trip. One block is published, 50% of block producers needs to send it to you. And once you have that 50%, you can produce your block. Mm -hmm. Until you have that 50%, you cannot even produce it. So the block that does not have 50% of approvals is invalid. Okay, so what happens if you just don't get 50% then? So if, 50, if, more, if less than 50% are online, it stalls. Wow, okay. Right? Like definity, similar to definity. Uh, Similar to almost everything, which is not Ethereum 2.0, <laughs> but, but also it's, it's not two-thirds, it's 50%. Right. right. So that's that's already, mm -hmm. it's noticeable a bit better if you think about it, right? There's a big difference right, right, between, there is. between requiring two-thirds of people and 50%. Yeah. Because lower than the 50% is also has this side effect that if, if you have l less than 50%, mm -hmm. there could be another network in existence. Like, why do you have less than 50% block producers? One option right. is that there's a mm -hmm. global network split and there's another network building. Right. Okay. So, so, so here we, we get to this question of consistency versus availability. Yeah. If you allow less than fifty percent, clearly you like on the available side, right? Uh, requiring fifty one percent is, yeah, you know, being more on consistent side. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Uh, and so, it requires fifty percent <coughs> of approvals on the very previous block, uh, and um, uh, the way these approvals work is the moment you see the block, mm -hmm. you immediately or like after waiting for a little bit. Uh, for like two, let's say 200 milliseconds, you send the approval to the next block producer whom you know, uh, and then you wait for some longer time, let's say for like two seconds, or like for one second or two seconds, uh, that's a parameter of the system, and if you don't see the block, uh, then you send the same approval to the person two blocks ahead of you, uh, and then again, if you don't see the block in a little longer time, you send approval to the next person, right? So wait, you send approvals to block proposers as opposed to yes. the bl actual blocks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You send the, so, so you, you know. So, so from a given moment, yeah. you know, block proposers for every height going forward. At least, yes. at least if no other blocks happen in between, right? It is okay if the block proposers change when the next block is produced. If this block is the last block, yeah. uh, then for the next block that is built on top of it, you need to know block proposers for every height. Right. Depending on which height the next block will, will be pr produced, the, right. the, the, there could be skips, right? So like this, like the current block has height five. Right. You know that if the next block, if it's on height six, will be pr proposed by, one person, if it's height seven by some other, et cetera. Right. And so what you do is the moment you see the block at height five, you immediately send approvals to the person, you immediately send your approval to the person at height six who, who will be proposing at height six. Uh, and then, then if during one second you don't see the block, you send to the person who will be proposing at seven. If during one second and 100 milliseconds you don't see the block, you send to the next guy. Uh, and you increase the time uh, every time. Mm -hmm. So you are sending approvals for a specific block, not for, for, okay. for, the, for the tip of the chain as you know it right now. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. And you're saying that every block can change the the yeah. set of future. So, so, so we don't do that today. Today yeah. our our schedule is fixed. It's uh, fixed. But, but it technically can change if you want to for some reason. Okay. So when you have strong randomness that you talked about, you will deploy also. We the, might. Yes. Okay. Not necessarily because it doesn't really help with ddosing, because if you know the block proposers. For the particular block, you can dedose them. It doesn't help in any way that they shuffle. Right. Like right. if we don't using some Algorand slash Ouroboros magic, they are dedosable. You know, like so. Right. So that's a conscious choice. Uh, okay. Uh, and so and so that's pr practically the entire Doom Slug. And so what it gives is that uh, property number one: uh, if a particular block uh, has uh, fifty-one percent of those approvals on the on the block at the very previous height, mm -hmm. so the difference in heights is exactly one, uh, then this block. 
uh, is irreversible unless at least one seed gets slashed. Right, right? okay. Yeah. So we call it Dooms like finality. That makes sense, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, and then there's a finality gadget, which is running on top of that, leveraging the very same approvals. There's one extra field in the approval that finality gadget needs. Right. Uh, and with, with the finality gadget, uh, if everything goes very well, if blocks are not skipped, uh, then when this block is produced, this one becomes completely final. By completely, I mean BF, like standard BFT finality, where like one third needs to be slashed. Right. For it to be reversed. Uh, yeah. The second, pro but but if Dooms like produces, uh, if there's a skip, right? So, so for example, let's say one sec let's say we configure it to be one second, and one second is not realistic. Yeah. Right. Then, then you you will expect to always have those skips. And then you never uh, have finality. Uh, so what happens is, uh, in the Dooms like it is proven. Uh, that after finite amount of time there will be because of the delay. Uh, that after some finite amount of time there will be two blocks in a row with a doomslike finality, right? And so and, and it will happen very closely, <coughs> very close to that moment when you actually cross the uh, the time the actual realistic timeout for the blocks, right? So doomslike has finality, and because of doom sorry liveness, and because of doomslike liveness, finality gadget has liveness. Right. Because okay. because effectively what finality gadget well, says is that <coughs> if a single chain, I obviously work. Uh, and if there's a fork, then someone gets slashed. And you can only slash people a finite number of time. Okay, so you have liveness at fifty percent. Yes. Uh, okay. and, and then below fifty percent, it's not just we don't have guaranteed liveness, we don't have any liveness, it just right. stalls, yeah. Okay. So just to recap, the finality gadget if you have two blocks in a row, both of which by construction will have at least 50% of the votes for the previous block, mm -hmm. then you're in a situation where if there is a, f a fork, a break of the finality, then at least one first gets slashed. Almost. Almost. It, it, it does need to have two thirds in both blocks, of course. Oh, yeah. I see. Okay. But, but finality, but, but there's right. also, uh, so for finality gadget, it's okay if approval arrives late. So it's okay, like, right. like, let's say some approval was not included here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, if, if that approval arrives late, yep. finality gadget will, will take advantage of it. So okay. finality gadget at no, at nowhere uses <coughs> the assumption that approvals have to happen on the very previous block. Yeah. Okay. So same as Casper FFG, I guess. Casper FFG doesn't care when approval arrived. Yeah. It just uses the set of approvals, right? Right. So you don't care between uh, you know, 50 and, and above and 66 and above. Um, I guess we don't care even like from zero to... to LMD ghost, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <clears throat> but but I guess for sla for slashable there's no slashable behaviors in LMD ghost right so for slashable okay like for finality where someone will get slashed there is a threshold of two thirds right 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 yeah, yeah. FFG. right yeah. okay so basically you've you've taken these two things and you've called it uh, doom slug and you have slightly different properties yeah okay doom is like uh, that yeah. Below, yeah yes thank you so so yeah I, I would say like LMD ghost is doom slug and FFG is the finality gadget we call it NFG. Right. Finality gadget. But you're saying that it kind of it meshes in a, like slightly cleaner. So, so, so NFG will work with anything. It will work with LMD Ghost. Right. Uh, it, it is it is to an extent similar to FFG. Mm -hmm. uh, the only like major difference is that in NFG in FFG for finality you actually do need two consecutive blocks. Well, in your case it would be epochs, right? Right, epochs. Yeah. Right, but but we run finality gadget on the block level. Right. So if we did use FFG, we would need to have two consecutive blocks where one of them has two thirds approvals on the previous one. Uh, and NFG, NFG is very similar to FFG. It's very similar construction, but, the N stand but it doesn't have this requirement. So you have, you have the N, okay, so the, the folk choice is doom slug and then you have NFG, right? Yeah. What, oh, N is near, of course. Yeah, or okay. like nitrate. Nitrate, yeah. okay, great. Yep. And it's like NFG and FFG, like, like it also uses like reference reference blocks. It's very similar construction. Right. Uh, but, but slightly different, so sufficiently different to remove that requirement. Okay, great. Um, I mean, while we're on the topic of like voting with stake, I think it's very important to understand, you know, what is the distribution of stake? Because in Eve 2, we're in a very unique position where, you know, we have a running network with, you know, let's say $30 billion of mm -hmm. stake, and it's very decentralized. Yep. Um, and I think, um, you know, Neo, you've come up with some clever ideas to find, to have an initial distribution, which is quite relatively decentralized. So, so those ideas are all currently in, still in discussion. Okay. Right. So, all the ideas we were discussing last year. Yeah. None of them is really in production yet. Okay. Right. So, so we do have some amount of pre-sale. Yes. Uh, which is uh, below thirty percent, or or like close to it, which is split between us, people who built it. Yeah. And also people who, who funded it. Right. Right. So, uh, and. Uh, so you mean thirty percent of the stake at launch or? At launch. At launch. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. So the remaining 70%, the goal is to distribute them 
to the community oh, the exact way. Uh, there are many ideas. Uh, none of them still is decided to certainly take uh, take place. Uh, but but like some some ideas uh, would be to use something that the handshake was doing. Handshake was like doing very very nice targeted drops to uh, like GitHub accounts, for example. Right. Or or like have some way of uh, of people doing some like doing lock drops where people can lock Ethereum, like what Edgeware was doing. Uh, okay. So pe people before us already found many many ways to distribute tokens. We just mm -hmm. we just need to to analyze and 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 they also already did distribute tokens this way. So what we need to do and we don't have enough information yet is just to look how it went, like what happened to the token holders of Handshake. Right. What happened to the token holders of Edgeware? Well, I guess okay. Edgeware is not liquid yet. Oh no, they did launch a few days ago, I think. Oh, they did. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. So so we will have we will have information mm -hmm. to make a good. But but the goal is yes, yeah, the goal is at least remaining seventy percent must be as distributed as possible. Right. Yeah. Okay, understood. Um, and so I guess system chain we covered. Yeah. So your your system chain you call it the the main chain, right? Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, okay, and for the, the deposits, you know, we have a deposit contract on mm -hmm. two. And you said you you also have the contracts, but you call them staking contracts. I so, guess. So that thing, so so that could have been a contract, but instead it's just a, on the protocol level there's a separate kind of transaction. Right. Which is a staking transaction. Right. Uh, where, if you execute a staking transaction, it locks the the money, and in the next epoch, if you do pass the threshold, uh, you you become a block producer. Uh, if you don't, uh, you can at any point withdraw the stake, but for as long as you have it, uh, you can you can you can. Validate. So does the stake transaction, if you're delegating, mm -hmm. does it point towards a delegation contract? Oh, so if you, if you delegate, you that's not a staking transaction, that's just a oh. regular contract call. Yeah. Oh, I see. So basically, you have a delegation contract, and mm -hmm. then the, de the delegation contract makes the, the, the staking transaction. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, so yeah, so, so, so delegation from delegation contract, staking transaction is just one thing it can execute. Uh, right. And delegation contract, it's not like us. Every particular entity that wants to be delegatee right. has their own contract. Uh -huh. And so they're responsible to audit it. Yeah. Okay, great. Cool. Um, so I guess one of the things that I've been trying to, uh, to do in the space is have the various blockchain projects agree on basic primitives. Mm -hmm. So can we talk about those? Yeah, yeah, let's, so, let's do that. So, uh, like, one which is probably the least controversial is, is the hash function. Mm -hmm. Do you use SHA-256? So we do use SHA-256 today. Yeah. There are internal discussions to use like Blake 3. Oh, the non-secure one. Well, that, that, <laughs> that, that sort of. So, right. so if it is not, not secure, that, that will be brought up, I guess, right. during the conversation. That conversation is not very active. Uh, so one of the biggest considerations for us when we choose the primitives is that we need to have interrupt with Ethereum. So with Ethereum, one cannot. Oh, it, right. We cannot use it, right? right? So because we need, like in any foreseeable future, most of the assets will <coughs> be on Ethereum. If we cannot freely speak to Ethereum one, uh, right. we cannot, we cannot take take advantage of those assets, right? And right. so the the hash function <coughs> we use must be verifiable on Ethereum. Signatures we use must be verifiable on Ethereum. Right. So that's one of the big considerations. <coughs> I actually don't know which BLS curves you can validate today on Ethereum. So right now, only um, no no BLS curves, okay. only the BN two five four. But there is a proposal. There's two proposals. I guess one is to just uh, implement the most important curve for us, probably, which is BLS twelve three eighty one. Mm -hmm. But there's a other proposal, which is to have an opcode, which is well, actually a family of opcodes, which are much more general and support a very wide range mm -hmm. of curves. So for example, all the BLS twelve curves. Or, yeah. um, yeah. But, but it's one of the reasons why we don't use BLS today is that when you only have 200 validators, block producers, it is actually feasible to send that many signatures. And right, them. right. Uh, but also because of that, we can we can send our blocks to Ethereum and validate them on Ethereum side because right. it's ED2559, which can be validated on Ethereum side. Okay, so you're using ED2559. Yeah. Okay. Um, and... I forget, what is the opcode support for this on, on Ethereum 1? Well, I don't know. I don't know either. Oh, uh, well, if it, is it supported on Ethereum? I well, I, I hope it is. Uh, <laughs> so, so, so the beauty of this particular curve uh, is that 
uh, and that's pretty hacky. Uh, but this curve, this curve can be con converted to another curve called, I think it's called Gistretto. Right. Uh, which is the same as the digit 255 one line, but the group size is actually a prime, not prime multiplied by eight. Right, so uh, you remove the cofactor. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we don't do that under normal operation. In normal operation, you only use it as ed255519. Uh, but the randomness beacon that we abandoned uh, uses Ristretto because it does need. Uh, oh, wait, so you've abandoned it or you've postponed, postponed it? Postponed it. Well, okay. abandoned for the initial launch, right? Okay. So in the initial launch, we don't use Ristretto. Actually, we probably use it for VDFs, uh, sorry, VRFs. Mm -hmm. um, the same way, but the, cool, the thing is that the private key and the public key from ED255519 can be converted to Ristretto by just removing the cofactor, co yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, and then I guess another primitive, which would be good if we could standardize on, would be the networking layer. Mm -hmm. um, what do you use there? We use libptp. So networking, I'm, I'm not the best person to talk to. Right. For some, for some reason, we stopped using libptp. Okay. Uh, the reasons I will not remember. Okay. Uh, but to, today, we're not using libptp. Is it some sort of language support or? I mean, you guys are writing in Rust, is that right? Yeah, it is Rust, yeah. So okay. there's parity with P2P. Right. I, I, th I, think, I think generally most of the parity code we eventually removed was because of uh, parity uses very high abstraction layers. Right. Which are, we, we use very low abstraction layers generally. Right. And, and I think with P2P, uh, yeah. Um, we abandoned because it didn't work for us. Um, it tried um, at the end of last year, and it, it, that, at that time, P2P was in a state that I cannot figure out how to use their abstract neural code. And also, I think some functionality just didn't work uh, as well. Like the Lambda table didn't work very well. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. we, we that was period, right? Yeah. Yeah. So are you using like a custom solution right now? Yeah, we, we build our own network. OK, from scratch? Yeah. OK, cool. Uh, but, but, but it's not like we would be against to use lib P2P. Right. It's just that at, at that point it was cheaper for us to build a custom uh, than to understand uh, the. Right. I, I think it was like both pretty complex to understand, but also at that point the stability was. Right. I mean, I think libptp has advanced leaps and bounds in terms of production readiness mm -hmm. with Eve two pushing it forward yeah. and all the other blockchain projects using yeah. it. I mean, one of the things that was that was mentioned is that like. It, the maybe the abstractions of the P2P and Rust didn't fit well with mm -hmm. the way yeah. your your project was organized. I mean, are you thinking of having a single client, or do you want do you see a vision where there'll be multiple near clients, maybe some outside of the internal? So, team? so we absolutely need multiple clients. We only have one right now, naturally, because right. the spec isn't finalized, right? Right. So, for someone else trying to build it would be very Difficult. painful process. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but abstraction layer of lib P2P and parity is not to support multiple different clients, right? Parity has very different goal. Like right. th their goal is to create infrastructure in which people can build very different custom blockchains, right? So they right. need to have mm -hmm. higher abstraction. While near says there's one blockchain protocol, which is near right. with homogeneous shards, but we do want to support multiple different clients. Right. Likely those clients will be also written in different languages, uh, right? So we don't need the, the abstraction uh, mm -hmm. of lib P2P. We need something very specific. And so therefore, code base of near and parity are very different in terms of, for example, traits. You will see very few traits in, in near, while parity is almost every uh, class is uh, generic. OK. Um, so you mentioned that you, you absolutely need multiple clients. What is the thinking there? Oh, so the thinking is the same thing why Ethereum wants multiple clients, is that if there is an implementation bug, right? right so, so I don't think you can defend against spec bugs, uh, and except by, you know, like, Verifying spec very thoroughly, uh, but implementation bugs you can you can avoid if you have a sufficient number of implementations, each of them sufficiently popular so that no no implementation has like more than one third. Then if one implementation goes down, uh, the network remains live, right? Right. So so that's the that's the argument, uh, but also uh, you don't want like the second concern is that. Imagine near like five years from now decides to completely pivot to marketing automation and not work on blockchains anymore and abandons the client, right? It, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an extreme example, <laughs> right? But in this case, it's very good if there's another client where the team, like, like people can pick up and continue maintaining our I client, see. but there's no right. team that is up to speed to continue right. doing that. Every other client will continue. Uh, there's an e easier example. Imagine there's some company called Parity which says from now on parity is, is maintaining the community, right. there's going to be some delay 
right, until community is ready to, con to continue maintaining it, Geth, there is a team that continues building, right. you know, so it doesn't, uh, like right. the innovation doesn't stop. Um, I mean, I remember, you know, maybe a year and a half or a year ago, you know, the near team coming to us, potentially, you know, saying maybe we could build an Ethereum client, yeah. but, uh, you know, we need incentivization. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the, the, the proposal was that, you know, part of the, um, you know, inflation mm -hmm. would go to the, the team developing the client. Yeah. Um, do you think you would do that in there? For another team to so so it's it's hard to say with the client. So one thing we do today, uh, which is, uh, I, I don't remember if it was you who was like a big critic of this idea, but the idea is that part of the inflation goes to the contracts which gets executed, which get executed. So, so there's already oh, that's a cool idea that in place, right? Uh, so so and part of the inflation already goes to the foundation uh, to maintain the network, right? Right. So so there's a we don't it's not quite founder reward because I think founder reward was. Uh, the, the, the definition of founder reward was paying for the prior work. Well, in our case, we're saying this is this is the this right. is funding of the future work, right? Mm. So the the, sem the semantics sort of the implementation is the same. The semantic is different. Uh, so it, it would be feasible to have also part, like for example, part of that could be payment for the for the implementers. Okay. So you're saying that on day one you will have this feature where um, if a contract is being used, mm -hmm. as in transactions trigger it, yeah. then part of the transactions fees or even the inflation will go to the contract creator. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly how it works today. So today, oh. every contract which gets executed during the transaction gets a little, like right. a small fee from the transaction fee. Right. Uh, and so motivation behind that is that, like, if you envision the future where there's a lot of, um, or actually, that's not even future, it's present, right? So, so like, right. consider some DeFi primitive right. that exists today, right? Uh, they need to come up with some very uh, complex ways to monetize their projects, right? Because they, like, like if they're just a primitive, if, if they're not user-facing, then users don't pay for using them, right. right? So they need to figure out how to monetize. Mm -hmm. If it's a very popular primitive, like everybody builds on top of this building block, then that little fee could actually be meaningful, right. uh, meaningful monetization for them. As especially if it's not like a Silicon Valley company, but just a project for, uh, made by people. Right. You know, somewhere else that, that could be very meaningful. So how how does it work concretely? Like um, you, you mentioned, it's a cut of the transaction mm -hmm. fee, not the inflation. Yeah. Um, and like, is it a fixed percentage, like five percent? What? How, how does yeah, it work? Yeah, th I think it is fixed and constant. Okay, fixed and constant. And does that money go to an address, or can it also go to a contract? Uh, I don't know how it is implemented right now, but how it is supposed to be implemented is that the contract governs how exactly that money is used. Okay, so there is a possibility that, um, you know, whatever it is, the 10% the cut mm -hmm. is actually redistributed, given as a refund. Yes, so, so, that's, so, so there are a couple of problems there, so that's one of them. Yeah. Another one is that, uh, and, and also technically, <coughs> you can implement it today on Ethereum. Right. You, you can make the call to actually be payable and require some of the fees. But the power of the default is very yeah. important. Yes, yeah. right. So, so from this perspective, so, 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 so making it constant part of the reason was so that people, people mm -hmm. don't fork it out and make it cheaper. So right. people still can fork it out and make it cheaper by reimbursing you back. Right. Uh, but that, that becomes, uh, it, it's, not, it's not like as easy, you know, like if they right. can trivially just re reduce the, the cost. Right. Th that would be all over the place. Mm -hmm. if, it's, if it's an involved process, the hope is that it's going to be less uh, widespread. Right. Okay, understood. Uh, I mean, that's going to be a fascinating experiment mm -hmm. to watch yeah. out. Um, yeah, cool. Okay, so... so how how does the how do you create the randomness in the current block? Just the block proposal. So, 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 so random, so randomness of a particular block, yeah, is a VRF, yeah, of the block proposer of B, uh, seeded by by the randomness of the previous block. Oh, so basically you're using um, whether a block proposer shows up or doesn't show up. Yeah. So so that's yeah. So that's the influence. So the block proposer can choose not to produce. Okay. So let's assume that we have like uh, really good latency around the world, mm -hmm. and, and every block proposer shows up. Yeah. Does it mean you can predict what will be the random number? You know. In but you. Could, but how do you execute their VRF? Oh, because it's it's okay. It's it's so like they some can sort do that. Yeah. Nobody else can. I see. Okay. Okay. And I the understand. VRF comes with the proof immediately. So you, so you submit the output of the VRF and the proof right away. Okay. And it's not a restretto based VRF or something else. It is restretto based. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So so it is. So so we, we are using restretto today. Okay. Yeah. Understood. Uh, and the actual randomness beacon, uh, we 
we had like some smart ideas, but we ended up uh, just building right. what, what Definity does. So what effectively the way it works is yeah. uh, in, the, uh, in the epoch that yeah. precedes the epoch where you need to, 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 where you are a block producer, you run a DKG, right. which we, we just make it synchronous. So in the first, uh, mm -hmm. so, so, so what happens uh, is in the first like 10% of the epoch, roughly speaking, everybody yeah. commits to a polynomial of degree k minus one. Right. Where k minus k is fifty percent, not two thirds as in infinity. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody can install the number degree k minus one. Yeah, uh, and they they reveal the uh, the generator to the power of every uh, of, of of some k points, and then they send encrypted private shares to every participant, uh, and then we spend ninety percent of the epoch where the participant can say, you know what, what you sent me uh, does not correspond to the to the to the committed one, and so the the revealed. Uh, the revealed share. So, so the property is that if you have a polynomial of degree k minus one, uh, then if you if you, if you raise uh, a generator to the to the uh, to each element of the of the polynomial, I get, by by knowing any k of them, you can also interpolate the remaining ones, right? So that property remains. So by generator, do you mean some sort of seed that will allow you yeah. to generate points? So like every so every participant i uh, generates a polynomial pi of x, right? Right. Uh, and so what they publish is they publish g to the power pi of x uh, for some k points. Uh, and so... Oh, and g is like some sort of a elliptic elliptic, curve. Yeah, yeah okay. a strata point. Or, or it could be a BLS point, okay. right? If we did use BLS curve. Right. Uh, and so... Wait, so he commits to the coefficients of pi. Yeah, yeah. effectively. But the, the beauty is that uh, if, this, if this is a polynomial, right? Then knowing any k minus one, oh, sorry, yeah, 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 any yeah. k you can derive others, uh, that property remains. Mm -hmm. So many, may, maybe for people who are into cryptography, that's obvious. For, for me, that's uh, right. Uh, that was something new, right? <laughs> uh, and so then you also publish uh, encrypted version. So you encrypt uh, pi of x uh, with the public key uh, of the participant. So let's say this is j of the participant j. So this is also broadcasted. This is public, uh, right? Together, together with uh, uh, with the commitment, right? And so every participant now can come and say. Uh, this is the proof that it, it, this is not the encryption. Mm -hmm. oh, like you can cryptographically prove that this does not correspond to the same pi x that is uh, okay. that is used in the uh, in there, right? And so we, we, we dedicate ninety percent of the epoch, but it is synchronous. Okay. In the sense that if you do not show up mm -hmm. and you do not provide the proof, uh, then you cannot participate in the next epoch in the randomness beacon. You can still do everything else. Okay. Right. So for, so you can you can choose if you messed up and you didn't show up and you didn't challenge it. And you don't have your private share, you can still do approvals, validate blocks, you know, do all other duties. You just cannot participate in the beacon. Uh, and uh, the assumption is that after the DKG, mm -hmm. uh, if there are committed polynomials mm -hmm. which are not challenged, then at least K people, at least 50% of people actually have verified their shares and would have challenged during the epoch. And so in the next epoch, what happens is that if we do have committed non challenged polynomials, then we use this. And if we don't, uh, then, then we resort back to to the VDF, sorry, VRF. Okay. Right. Uh -huh, I see. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you have a fallback. Uh, and also another thing which is that, so let's call, uh, and so in the next epoch, we just use standard randomness beacon that Definity uses, right? Because you have this polynomial, the randomness output. Oh, right. What, yeah. When you have like a, a block uh, yeah, you just interpolate. H, uh, what you do is, yeah, you just interpolate. You, can, you, you just compute H to the power <clears> of, so everybody adds up their polynomials. Right, so that gives right. you p of x, uh, and you just compute h to the p of zero. Okay. And yeah. Nobody knows p of zero, right? Uh, and uh, <coughs> okay. Uh, but even even more to that, instead of using h here, uh, we use this thing, right? Randomness of the previous block. So like VD, VRF that is published in the previous block, and so what it gives you is that even if someone did break, like if someone did manage to get access of fifty percent of the uh, of the shares, and they can completely predict the output of the uh, uh, right. of the of the of the of this randomness beacon. Right. Uh, they still only have one bit of influence because they still can only produce or not the block produce. or not produce. Right. right. So, so it has all the properties of, of of the underlying randomness of the seeds. Right. Yeah. Okay, I see. But in the good case, you get. You get completely unbiasable and predictable randomness unless someone has fifty percent of shares and assuming that DKG didn't didn't break. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that's very interesting because I remember maybe roughly a year ago 
you were telling me that um, you know, Definity is all great and all, but yeah. the one problem is the DKG. It might yeah. be impossible. Right. Or it might be too hard to, to, yeah. to deploy it in practice. Yep. So you've gone down the DKG route, but it sounds like you've made some changes. Right. Um, so, so effectively, we just, we just said, well, we're okay with... Because if, you, if, you do, if you're not okay with synchronous network assumption, that becomes way more complex. Right. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so you can... I, I think you can pretty trivially create a DKG in which 30% of people can... Uh, can, can, can predict it not 60%. Okay. Right, so you can parameterize it right, in right. such a way that you need 30% to break liveness, 30% to break, mm -hmm. uh, to make it predictable, while uh, with a synchronous network assumption, if you, if you make the threshold 66%, you need 30% to break liveness, 66% to break, uh, right, and, and then we can push it to 50%, because, because okay. we want it to work. We, we want liveness to, to, main, to remain with 50%, right? Yeah. Okay, understood. so you basically you have stronger assumptions, which makes the construction simpler. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, and so like a year ago, if, if someone told me like, let's use synchronous network assumption, I would say, are you crazy? But right. then like in practice, if you think about it, it's actually very meaningful to assume that during half a day, mm -hmm. right, everybody will have at least one opportunity to show up and validate their share. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and like the argument here is that if during the previous half a day, at no point you were able to, to show up and, and validate your share, mm -hmm. uh, then probably you're also not gonna be very live in the next epoch, and so and so you, right. you sort of right. offline anyway. Like you can be considered offline. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one thing I'm interested in is, um, let's see, um, gas gas mm -hmm. schedule. Yeah. So um, in in if two, we're we're looking at something called a EIP one five five nine, and you know, as you described it once, it's like this uh, exponen exponentially moving average. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, you know, we basically have this, this base fee that, it, that gets burnt. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we also have these uh, variable size blocks. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we're trying to fix some of the, the problems of gas. What, are, what is your thinking around gas? I, I think we use something almost identical. Okay. In the sense that I think if it's half... Okay, Bo Bowen, correct me if I'm saying something wrong. If, if, if the block is more than half full, we increase the price. If it's less than half full, we decrease, something like that, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I okay. think it's very similar. Okay, cool. Well, that's a nice like, kind of confirmation that we're, we might be on the, yeah. on the right path. Um, okay, one question I have is regarding the committee size. So you mentioned mm -hmm. there's, let's say, 200 validators yeah. and eight shards. Mm -hmm. And each slot gets basically assigned to uh, so, so not quite. So what happens is, uh, and, and I think this is this is where we're more like Polkadot school than Ethereum school, uh -huh, right? right. Uh, so in our case, so there's a total of 200 block producers. Yes. Uh, and let's say every five of them, so, so like they split into groups of five, uh, and each five well, they are assigned to some five shards. Uh, th that's assuming like there's 100 shards. If there's eight shards, it's less interesting to analyze. Right? But let's say there's 100 shards, there's like 100 block producers, uh, and, and there's some bipartite matching, it's not quite bipartite matching, but uh, uh, let's say first five block producers are assigned to the first five shards, and then block producers from 10 to 15 are assigned like, to shards from Wait, 10 so to 15. Wait, so you're saying the committee size is five. five? Yes, committee size is very small. Uh, and, <laughs> and so every person who is assigned to a shard, they then load the state, right? So every, yeah. everybody has five state of five shards. Um, and, uh, and, so they, and so therefore, they just, they just take turns between five of them to produce chunks, right? Uh, and that committee, it's not even technically a committee because when you produce a chunk, the remaining four don't have to, to sign on it, right? So oh, it's not so really a committee. You, you, you alone are attesting to the validity of it. Uh, and what happens next is uh, uh, the person who produces blocks, they obviously have no insight into the validity of chunks. All, for all they know, right, I have a right, header, right. and the header kind of looks looks legit. Like hashes, hashes check out, signatures check out, so they include it. Okay, so they really like propose the committees more yeah, than okay. Yeah. Uh, so what happens next is uh, one thing uh, which we use that's that's again polka dot thingy uh, is that when you produce a chunk, uh, so so let's say let's like draw this like there's this 200 people right, uh, and so these people are across all, across all the shards. So when the particular person, like say this guy, uh, when he when he proposes a chunk, uh, what they do is they, they compute an erasure code of that chunk, mm -hmm. uh, which in our case, let's say, uh, so for, for theoretical guarantees, it needs to be uh, 6x big. So right. like for, for something that is one meg, you will need to be 6 megs, but we, we, in practice, we use less than that. 
uh, because in, in practice, in practice, you still cannot break it, but you cannot theoretically prove now that it's unbreakable. Uh, Wait, so what is your block size? Uh, or your chunk size, as you say? Wait, so, so the erasure coding is at the chunk level, right? Or it is on the chunk level, yes. Yeah. So, so it's based on the gas, uh, and uh, I actually have no idea what the size is. I think it's uh, 1,000 maximum. Uh, it, can you have uh, at most 1,000 from back uh, past the seat? But there's also some gas limit, right? Yeah, there's also some yeah. gas limit. Yeah. So, so it, it's... So the gas limit is pretty much one second of complete time. Yeah, okay, so let's see. Um, 1,000 transactions, let's say that's about 200 kilobytes. Let's yeah, say. Yeah. Okay. And then you have let's did you say six X or Yeah. So it's like Okay, one megabyte, let's yeah, say. Yeah, one megabyte, yeah. Okay. So what you do then is you send those uh but but then one megabyte every second we're talking about here. Well that's your goal, right? That's very ambitious. <laughs> well all, all of that can be fine tuned, right? Right. Yeah, like like that that can be decreased. Right, right. If we if we can if we can produce smaller <coughs> blocks but still every second, we we will go that route. Uh, the right. larger blocks are right. less frequently. Mm -hmm. Because uh like for for as, for as long as Nightshade Finality Gadget finalizes them, right? The biggest concern uh, of short block times disappears, right? The, the biggest concern usually is that uh, it affects, like in proof of work, for example, if you if you make it too short, uh, then the adversary who, who who does not have forkfulness, right? Uh, they, they they have advantage, right? Right. But if you have if you have a BFT finality on the blocks, that's sort of not as as big of a concern. I mean, you can have centralization on the proposing. Uh, centralization on the proposing. Okay, so l let's finish that, then, right. then we can think about it. Uh, but what you do is, well, let's ambitiously say it is one megabyte, right? So it is one, one megabyte after you erasure coded it, right? Yeah. So it, it is split into small parts, exactly to, uh, so, so let's say for now, for simplicity, exactly 200 of them. Uh, as Even with this committee size and definitely with biggers, it will be a sample of, of block producers, not, not all of them. Mm -hmm. But for simplicity, let's say it's all of them. Yeah. And so you send one part uh, to every block proposer. Yeah. Uh, and they don't need uh, to confirm it in any way, besides that if they attest to, to the block, it means that, uh, they that means that they have one little part for every chunk that that block has, right? And so that means that if the block has 50% attestations, that means that 50% of people right. attest to the okay. fact that they have the, their little parts of the blocks, right? And so then uh, why the 6x is that if you assume that there's less than 30% of people who who for some reason lie to you, uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, then you have that one six to, to recover, right? right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and like, how do you prove that, um, you know, every... Oh, that they don't know, like optimistically say? No. Oh, oh the, the, this thing is Merkleized. Right, so there's a Merkle root of this particular, of this little part. Right. Uh, so this Merkle, Merkle hash mm -hmm. uh, is in the chunk header. Yes. And so chunk hash naturally depends on it now. Yes. And so the block hash depends on it. And what if? And so if someone then loads the whole chunk, yeah, and they re-encode it and arrive to a different Merkle root, that's a that's a challenge. That's right. that's an that's a that's a special behavior, right? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, <clears throat> so so effectively, what happens is that what can go wrong here, right? So one thing is that you can send something which is not. Uh, um, so so another thing you can do is you can compute an incorrect erasure code coding. And compute the Merkle. Oh yeah. So, so if it's incorrect erasure coding, uh, then the Merkle root will not match. Right. Right. When someone encodes it, if it's uh, if it's completely irrecoverable, uh, yeah. Then then it's also easy to show. Like I, like yeah, I will yeah. show I will show a sufficient number of parts with Merkle root, and everybody will see it's irrecoverable, uh, and and they cannot send something that does not correspond to the Merkle root at all. Okay. So here's one thing I'm worried about. That um, so basically you have the. Uh, the, the, the chunk proposes, let's say he creates garbage in mm -hmm. major codes. He sends them all off. Yeah. Um, and this this specific chunk goes in the block. Mm -hmm. And then you get the finality gadget, you know, which happens in two seconds because each block is one yeah. second long. And that's not enough time for someone to both kind of reconstruct everything, detect that it's wrong, and yeah. submit something on chain. Yep. So does it mean that you might have to revert finality? Yes. So finality. So f finality is a little tricky in this case, uh, and that's something that we're very upfront with people when, like, you know, like if we talk to someone who potentially might integrate with Neo, we're very clear right. that you either <coughs> have to run all shards locally, not necessarily in the same machine, it could be on multiple machines, but if you locally run all the shards, then finality is final <coughs> for you because you know the challenge is not coming. Right. Or alternatively, you, you need, you need mm. to have 
alternatively, the, the concept of finality <laughs> for you is, yes, it is finalized by NFG, but also sufficient time has passed uh, that you're certain enough that the challenge, if it, if it was existent, would have come through, right? So like, for example, if you okay. exchange, you, can, you actually have a structure <coughs> to run all, all the shards. Right. For you, finality is actually... But how does it blocks. work? Okay, so I understand finality from the point of mm. view of the user, that yeah. you can have these extra checks, yep. either by waiting more mm. or by downloading the chain yourself. But what about from the point of view of the chain and the, and, mm -hmm. and the proposers? Because presumably, they would suddenly have to move to a different chain and yeah. do like, a, you know. Right, so, so it, is, it is actually, with, especially with a single chain, it's actually pretty simple, right? So, so imagine like you're building a chain uh, and then suddenly, sometime later, it was, it, was, it was proven that this block has an invalid chunk. Right. Well, it's very simple. You just, you, locally, you just say these blocks are invalid. This is my tip. And you continue operating. And will you just continue working here, just ignoring this uh, no. ever existed? So, so that was the initial plan, but that's actually very hard to do. OK. Uh, <laughs> well, at least it's way harder to on implementation level. So on implementation level, it's way easier to continue like this. So the, hi the height will continue from here. Uh. It's going to be the next height. But this is the parent. It has some complications mm -hmm. because uh, now the finality gadget and Doomslug need to be aware of the <coughs> because if the finality right. gadget and Doomslug have no idea that blocks can be challenged, then this is indistinguishable from actually someone forking out. Right. right? Yeah. So that that should cause special behavior. Right. So the way to solve is uh, well without details of finality gadget and Doomslug, it's not that easy to say. But effectively, what it like finality gadget, for example, has a concept of a score, which needs to be strictly like increasing in certain cases, uh -huh. and we're just saying that if there's a challenged block, right. uh, then the score, uh, you can effectively say the score of the, you can increase the score of the block by presenting a challenged block which has higher score, uh, which will install the finality gadget. Okay. So finality gadget will be dysfunctional here, but we will be able to, to, re to restart it here by proving that the score sh has to be higher because there's a challenged block with a higher score. Okay. I mean, it will be interesting to see how this kind of finality gadget will get integrated in a system like Cosmos, right? Yeah. But in Cosmos, you know, you have a weak verifier that mm -hmm. can't do some of the things that yep. a, a user can do. Um, <clears throat> and also kind of Cosmos tries to rely on kind of really strong finality, but you have kind of... But, but, but so, 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 there's a, so we already have an Ethereum bridge, which has exactly the same problem, right? Ethereum bridge needs to know the latest block. Uh, so the argument right. here is the following, that uh, for, first of all, the challenges presumably should propagate relatively fast in a, in, in, in a sense that uh, because of the data availability, you should be able to download the chunk no slower than any valid chunk. And valid chunks, you like on the, on the normal circumstances, right. on the normal conditions, you don't load chunk between every two blocks because that's, that's, that's how you operate, right? Uh, and so the downloading should not take more than one block time. Uh, preparing the challenge and like distributing it could take some time because it's pretty large. Mm -hmm. to, today, we don't use small challenges. We use like uh, the size of the challenge is proportional to the size of the chunk. But like it should not take more than, you know, like, like let's say 20 blocks or right. something like that, right? In practice. And so uh, if it was challenged after 20 blocks, uh, then this chain will stop. It will stop growing. It cannot grow anymore because all the honest oh, people switch so to the new one. Oh, so you can detect that. Uh, and so what happens is that effectively, if you're saying my finality is I see a final block and I see another block which has it in the ancestry, which is like 100, 100 heights, beyond, right. then this is final because that block would not have been right. created if this block was challenged. I see. So Cosmos can do that strategy. Yeah, for example, yeah. Right. Okay. Mm -mm. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so, so that, that's one option. It's not, it, on Ethereum bridge, we just ignore challenges for now. But So one thing I'm very interested in is um, state. Mm -hmm. So in if 2 we kind of have the stateless client model. Yeah. Um, and so my question is, like, do you have statelessness? and like, how large do you imagine the state will become per, mm -hmm. oh, how do you call it? So per sub? Let's call it shard. It's still shard. Per shard. Yeah. Okay, it's still a shard. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so it's hard to estimate how, how big the, sa the state will be, but mm -hmm. we we, state rent is built in, into near. You have state rent. Wow. We, have, we do okay. have state rent. And uh, uh, we have some, so, so, so state rent was built not by me, so I don't know all the, all the answers, but uh, like we have some solutions for all the well-known problems, right? So for example, uh, like the account can be deleted. Uh, but when you want to chip in? <coughs> so, so with state trend, like let, can, can I restore the account if it, if it got nuked? Uh, not, not yet, but we 
we probably will in implement some sort of hibernation in the future, yeah. but then you need some like archival node that will actually have the data once mm -hmm. you have the money to recover. Yeah. But that is not here today. But yeah. But, but today account just dies. Yeah, just dies. Yeah, okay. Account just dies if you don't pay. Okay, I, account just dies if you don't pay. And that will be at launch, you'll have statements. It, it, is, it is there today, yeah. Like it, today, if you create an account on Near, okay. and then don't pay for a while, it dies. Okay, so you're trying to bound the state. Because mm -hmm. what I'm worried about is, you know, the, the proposers, they're going to be shuffled from one shot to another. Mm -hmm. And they might need some time to sync. Right. So, so, yeah, but they have half a day for that. Because you know, the, the, the shuffling happens one epoch in advance. Oh, so you know the shards. Uh, and so you're downloading the state. So, so the way it works is, so, so like, let's say this is the previous epoch, right? Uh, and this is the epoch in which you, you're supposed to validate. Mm -hmm. So the shuffling happens at this point. So at this point, you know everybody who will be validating in this epoch. And so you immediately, you know the shard assignments. So you have half a day to download. Uh, the uh, the state, uh, and then uh, there, there are like some implementation details here, which is once you downloaded the state, you need to start applying block applying blocks, because state at this point is different from state at this point, right? right? So what happens is you download the state. Once you got here, right? Uh, there's this process called catching up, right? Uh, where you apply all these blocks for these shards, and then for every block after that, you you just apply current shards and the next shards. So so what you validate now, what you validate next time. Okay, so if I understand correctly. Like half a day in advance, you will know these five shards mm -hmm. that you need to sync up. Yeah. Okay. And okay. And the state could be, let's say, I don't know, 10 gigabyte per shard. That's 50 gigabytes download in half a day. That yeah, maybe. Possibly yeah. doable. Yep. Okay. And, and yeah. <clears throat> yep. Okay, cool. Um, but, but other than that, like the biggest problem in state, which like I would love to solve, but we have no solution today. Is that updating Merkle trees is very expensive? Right. Like, like if we can get get rid of Merkle trees, we will easily like five x the number of transactions we can process. Uh, but today, today we cannot get rid of them. We don't have a good solution for that. I mean, one kind of brutal solution is like a Merkle tree ASIC. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> or, or like even even like running them properly on multiple right. cores. It's not something that commonly is commonly done today. Uh, there was something else interesting about state. Um, yeah, don't remember. Okay. Um, so one thing that you guys innovated on um, is like guaranteed execution. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit more about right. that? So, so the way it works is uh, um, <clears throat> uh, so when you have, let me erase something. So, so it's not, guaranteed execution is a little bit strong of a word. It's, it's sort right. of gu guaranteed receipt delivery. So receipt will be delivered, uh, but then later it can get, uh, for various reasons, uh, the most obvious, you might, you might not have enough gas to execute it, right? It will, it will get nuked. Uh, but it will be delivered. It will not get lost on the way. And you don't have to sort of monitor it. So the way it works is, uh, when you create a chunk, uh, so first of all, I think what is important to notice is that the, the chunk contains the state root as of before transactions in the chunk are applied. Okay. Uh, not as of after. Right. Uh, I don't remember how it is done in Ethereum, but uh, after. Uh, yeah. So, so what it what it what it what it allows you to do is that if you if you do after, uh, then you have transaction execution serialized twice, uh, because uh, for you to create a block, uh, you need to, like, the, let's say there's only Alice and Bob. There's only two block producers, and then they take turns okay. creating blocks, right? So Alice just created the block. Mm -hmm. Uh, and before to create a block, she executed all the transactions in the block because she needed the post state root right. before she even sent the block to Bob. Uh, Bob received the block. I mean, at the very least, she, Alice wants to know if she's going to get paid, you know, a decent amount of fees, for example. But, but fee, fees, it should be the it should be the fact that when you include the transaction, you should be able to estimate the fee. Well, because, because heuristically, maybe. Heuristically, yeah. But but also because fees are paid at the end, split equally. Split equally to between the block pro like it doesn't matter whether you included the transaction or someone else, it gets oh so you mean, you mean this committee of five validates? even over hundred at the end of the day all the hundred gets paid more or less equally at the end of the Wait, so what's the advantage for me to show up even as a proposer well proportional to your participation you you still need to participate oh uh, proportional <coughs> to oh very interesting yeah okay uh, and so then Bob they receive the block and uh, 
the first thing they need to do is to apply these transactions because they they need to validate them. Right. 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 And so after that, they they produce their block. Now they need to run their transaction. Right. And so you can see that uh, the transactions they they get serially executed twice from the from every block. Right. 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 So, so that that's that's unfortunate. And so instead, I think it's pretty mm -hmm. common now to include pre-state root right. in the chunk, right? So you know pre-state root so naturally. So who else is doing that? I think, I think many people do. I actually, I actually don't want to say name and be wrong. Okay. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, but I think it's, uh, uh, at least like if you read papers, it, like, oh, Flow. Flow for sure does that. Okay. That's I like the big thing uh, that they're saying. Okay. Uh, and so, so instead we include the pre-state root. Uh, and pre-state root complicates it a little bit. With the post-state root, it, it would have been easier. But, but the way it works now is that, uh, <coughs> uh, so this is Alice uh, and Bob in one shard, and this Carol and Dave in another shard. So when Alice produces the block, uh, sorry, the chunk uh, for height, so let's say this is two consecutive heights, seven and eight, and for simplicity, let's say heights are not skipped and all the chunks are produced. Uh, when Alice produces the chunk for height seven, uh, remember she like creates those little uh, parts, uh, like the, the Right. Erasure coding shares. We call yeah. them parts for some reason. Okay, parts. Should be call, call, should call them shares. Uh, so she sends the part to everybody, including Carol and Dave. And as she does that, uh, she knows which hearts Carol and Dave validate. She also sends them the receipts. But the receipts she sends them. Wait, wait. But she didn't do execution. Right? Exactly. So the, the receipts she sends them are the receipts as of applying the previous chunk. Ah. Right. So there was a chunk before at height six. Right. Uh, and so Alice, before producing chunk seven, she executed. Chunk six. Right. Right. Uh, and so chunk seven now, chunk only contains two, two things in the body. It's the transactions that include it and the receipts as of executing the previous chunk. Why do you need to communicate receipts? Why do we need, well, so that, well, you definitely need to oh, communicate that, receipts. That, that, that's your, your cross out communication yeah. mechanism. Yes, exactly. Right. right. And so okay. the chunk contains transactions and receipts. Receipts have Merkle proof, right? Which again, <coughs> uh, so, so now, and so the Merkle proof of the receipts. Uh, it's done in an interesting way. So this is all the outgoing receipts. Uh, they sorted by the shard ID, the, the destination shard ID, right? And so within each shard, they more coalesced. Then they more coalesced combined. Mm -hmm. And so when I send receipts to, to, to Dylan or whomever is D, yeah. Dave, uh, <clears throat> I send him the entirety of his, uh, of his portion uh, with, the, with, the upper, with the upper portion of the Merkle proof. He doesn't need the lower. But in the future, you can uh, prove inclusion of any okay. receipt using the whole tree. And so at this point, uh, by the time <coughs> Dylan or Dave produces uh, for height eight, uh, they have the, the right. receipts as of six. So it might feel that there is a two blocks delay, but mm -hmm. actually there is none. So, so they will include, uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, 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 so they will know those receipts for six. Right. Uh, but the cool thing is that, um, Think about this. Uh, for Dylan to even create a chunk at height eight, to create a chunk at height eight, Dylan needs to read, to have the block at height seven, right? When the, Dylan accepts the block at height seven, and then they produce the ch the, the chunk at height eight. Mm -hmm. And the condition, if you remember, the condition to receive the block is right. to say I have my little part for every chunk included, right? Which include which includes the part mm. for seven, right? So th the moment Dylan accepts the block at height seven, they have their part. At seven, and so therefore they have all the incoming receipts, and so when they execute their chunk at height seven, mm -hmm. they have all the incoming receipts. <clears throat> okay, um, but okay, but you, okay, so you have you don't have guaranteed execution because you have this uh, queuing, yeah. and then you might even like just remove things from the queue if it becomes unmanageable. So, so we, we we won't <coughs> remove them. We will still fail the transaction. It's just that failing failing the transaction costs very little. So you can you can. Like there is the, the queue, the queue will start right. depleting way faster. I see. Okay, but even for the guaranteed delivery, which is a very cool property, what if everyone sends receipts to one shard? Then now, this one shard, you know, they need to download so much more data, right? Yeah. So so they so so that's uh, that's a problem. So what will happen uh, eventually is yes. that um, uh, so so what will happen in practice is that uh, Dylan. He's supposed to produce a chunk, and, and people send him the, the one part as of that block. And there's so much network that he doesn't even manage to download all of them right. before producing the next block. So he skips the, the bit. Uh, same happens to Carol. Same yeah. happens to Dylan. Yeah. Same happens to Carol. Yeah. Finally, D Dylan downloaded them. So he produces the chunk, dumps all of them to the storage. Oh. Uh, yeah. 
uh, and you do not you do not really include the the receipts into the into the parts. Right. So uh, so whomever will validate like Carol and other guys, but but they're on the same <coughs> schedule, right? So so they will mm -hmm. uh, they will catch up. So so that's sort of unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, but it only happens if literally every shard is is right. bombarding Dylan. Uh, but but also like like if you think about it, obviously. Uh, on, from the network perspective, the number of receipts we're sending is not is not. We're configuring it so so that it's not a bottleneck. We, we don't want you to be practically at capacity on the network, in terms of how much you receive. So so even if there's right, but this problem will just keep on getting bigger as you add more shards, right? Uh, with more shard, shards, yes. And so once we try to scale way beyond, so with hundred shards, it's already quite a bit of a problem, but not yeah. as terrible because it doesn't mean it will take you hundred blocks to download the receipts. Right. It will take less. Because mm -hmm. because it's not the bottleneck, right. but like if we want to go to thousand shards, that becomes unfeasible. At that point, we need some other techniques where we're gonna, uh, like the the most natural one, uh, mm -hmm. but it's a high level idea. Obviously, it has many issues. Is that uh, there's a there's a limit to how much a particular shard could, could send to a specific shard right. in, in in one block time. So it's not. Ah, I so, see. So, so right now, effectively, analysis. Analysis shard. Every transaction can generate a receipt to to Dylan's. Right. And then we say, well. You can only include that many. Right. At, at which point the rest will, uh, will like get recued, for example. Okay. So you can mitigate the impact of having more shards. Yeah. Okay. But but that has many problems. For example, if you recue it, uh, if you what? Like, like like let's say let's say because Alice when she produces a block, she doesn't know which receipts will be created. Yeah. So she cannot not include the transaction that generates a receipt. Right. So when the block is executed, uh, once you hit the capacity, you need to do something with the remaining transactions. Right. So most likely you will just recue them. Like put them into the queue. Requeue, okay. The, the, the same way you do it today with receipts. Yeah. Uh, but then the problem is that when, when when those transactions come back to the next block, again half like large percentage of them will get to the queue. Right. So that's quadratic. That's uh -huh. that's like that's not that's not a viable solution. Right. But it's just like a high level mm -hmm. one high level idea how it could be done mm -hmm. with a bigger number of shards. But that, that's an open problem. Right. With eight shards, it obviously works. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that you guys have innovated on, and you kind of drew a diagram at one point, is like you have the state, and then instead of being kind of nicely partitioned regularly, you kind of is more dynamic. Like this, mm -hmm. can you talk about this a bit more? So first of all, this is not built. This is not built. So okay. today it's static, uh, but the idea would be that <clears throat> as as the shards execute transactions, you can monitor which shard is more busy than others. Yeah. Uh, and then at that point, you can. <clears throat> Uh, you can start shifting the the boundaries. Mm -hmm. they, they're still going to be uh, contiguous chunks, right? So if there's a particular contract which is disproportionately large, then at the very best case, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it, it will yeah. be in the same yeah. shard, right? Yeah. In the shard on its own. Uh, but this is uh, the idea is that the way state sync works is that when you do state sync, uh, you don't load contiguous parts of the state uh, mm -hmm. with the Merkle proof, and the Merkle root is global. Right. right. You, you can easily compute global Merkle root just by Merkleizing right. the, yeah, mm -hmm. the Merkle roots of the chunks. Right. So the Merkle root is global. And so uh, with this resharding, it will it will happen, let's say, on the epoch boundary. Mm. Right. And so when you download the state for the next shard, you know the new new boundaries. It's it's actually it, it's it's a slight complication because today you download from a particular person the entire state. Right. Now you just need to be smart. You need to say, oh, in the previous epoch it was like this. Right. Right. So you will say, well, this this part <coughs> uh, th this Mm -hmm. This part I will then load uh, from someone who was following this chart, right. and this part I will then load from someone who was following this chart. But the rest of the state sync infrastructure is already supporting right. sending any part of the global state with the Merkle proof, uh, and so that that doesn't need to be changed. And, and other than that, it's the same as gas fee. You know, like like you look at how how busy the shard is. If it's if it's too busy, right, then you start resharding. Okay, so. And presumably, to keep the complexity reasonable, you'd only do the rebalancing, let's say, once a week or once a day or yeah. once per epoch. Once per epoch is actually doable because you need to, to read on low state anyway. <coughs> right. So it doesn't matter if it's going to be... Okay. Like, like at that point, actually having like, like the same boundaries doesn't give you much. Okay. And then prior to the rebalancing, you'd expect you know, every shard to have its own gas market with some variations. So, so that's, that's a... Unsolved problem at this point. Right. We, we we're debating right now internally. Okay. Uh, how exactly it should be done. So what are the options here? Uh, well, one option, uh, one option is to have gas market per shard, uh, which is. So that's unavoidable, no? Or is it? Well, mostly. So so. Uh, it's it's an open problem, right? But yeah, so gas market per shard has has fewer problems. 
Cool. Uh, but but it has a terrible UX right. from perspective of the user who submits a transaction. Yeah. Uh, and if you have global gas mar gas price, then obviously there's yeah. many problems. Like right. you know, congesting one shard will, will be increasing right. the price for everybody. So so that is that is an active active discussion, and that's something that can be fine <coughs> very easily, uh, even at the very late stage. Okay, great. Um, so one one of the things that we're uh, going with is Wasm. Mm -hmm. You guys are also doing Wasm. Yeah. Um, can you tell more about that? Like uh, compiled well, versus interpreted, or which engine specifically are you using? Will that and will will you have Wasm from day one? So yeah, we do have Wasm today. Yeah. So so the the VM today is Wasm. Yeah. Uh, I I think we use like single pass compiler. Single pass compiler. Yeah. Is it the case, Max? Yeah. Yeah, we're using single Wasmer. Yeah. Yeah, we use. Yeah, we use Wasmer today. Right. With a single pass without optimizations. Uh, even even more crazily, at this particular <laughs> point, we have floating point numbers enabled, uh, which are non-deterministic. Maybe uh, they have they have a particular source of non-determinism, which is NANs, uh, and we, we just plan to to mitigate that particular non-determinism. Which is what NANs? NANs, yeah. So so the problem is that uh, what's a NAND? N A N, not a number. Oh, not a number. So, so, yeah. so the particular problem with floats uh, and the source mm -hmm. of, like according to Wasm spec, the particular source of non-determinism is that if you have an operation which has two NANDs, uh, and those two NANDs have different representation, uh, like you add them up, then the output will be one of them. But which one depends, because a compiler can choose to optimize addition and, and swap the arguments, because addition ah. is commutative. Mm. But suddenly for NANDs, addition is not commutative. Right. Right, and so a wrong NAND can become the output. Right. right? But, but then obviously in a smart contract, that could, that your network diverged, your state is one bit different. Yeah, 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 that's terrible. Right? Uh, but NANDs can be, uh, you can choose a canonical representation for NAN, and just after every floating point operation, you can say now if it's NAN, use a very particular canonical representation. It becomes slower. Okay, uh, so you have works. to do a check is NAN every time. Yes. Okay. For every time you touch floating point numbers. Right. right. If the output is floating point number, which is which is no worse, of course, than completely banning floating point numbers. Okay. Uh, and the reason why we enabled floating point numbers, we had them disabled for a while, is that the actual devx is terrible, because you constantly accidentally use floating point numbers. Like you use, right. because at the end of the day, you use some of the, one of the languages which compiles to Wasm like assembly ah, script or Rust, uh -huh. and they have floating numbers all over the place. Like hash tables in, in mm -hmm. assembly script used to be using floating point numbers. Mm -hmm. I as a developer didn't do anything wrong, right. but suddenly my, my contract doesn't compile. Right. Right. Uh, and so we're just, we're just taking like half a step further. Instead of just banning floating points completely, we specifically solve the, right. the exact problem that, that exists. Uh, and also, so for Wasm smart contracts for, uh, with our particular bindings, you can do any asynchronous calls to any contract in any shard. The way you do that is you just say, this is the contract, this, the same way you do in Ethereum, but it's just asynchronous. So right. e every contract all is asynchronous? Every, every, Unless to yeah. allow this kind of stuff, right? Yes, uh, or, or like this kind of stuff, right? So in fact, what happens is, in a smart contract, you can say, now I want to call <coughs> another contract, uh, and at least in all the languages, languages we support today, there is a concept of a promise. Right. So it gives you a promise. So in your code, uh, right. your code is actually very readable. You're just saying, like, call this contract dot then, and then you provide what needs to happen next. Uh, on our end, we will separate it into two different, uh, whatever was and blobs, whatever they are. We will call the first one. Right. Schedule the receipt. Wait for the receipt. Receipt back. We'll call the second part. Uh -huh. So that is abstracted out. So doing everything asynchronously. That's what Definity is doing as well. Maybe. We don't know. Okay. <laughs> Definity uh, only knows. Uh, <laughs> uh, right. But but um, um, we also have this thing, <coughs> uh, which uh, uh, James Press, which built for us. Oh. Cool. Uh, which is we have a Ethereum virtual machine mm -hmm. as a smart contract compiled to Wasm deployed on one of the shards. And so within that virtual machine, you can run any VM contracts, but obviously they, they have no, like they, they live in the isolated world of a single shard. They, they have no concept of cross-shard communication because synchronous calls cross-shard kind of don't work. But within a particular shard, you can have, you can have a VM contracts running with, with synchronous calls between themselves. An Ethereum VM. Yeah, yeah, e EVM. Okay, yeah, so but at a specific version, like? Like, how do you governance on that? Like, you'll just freeze a specific value. Oh, it's, it's a smart contract. I, I don't know what exact governance today for grading that contract. Okay. Uh, but like any smart contract on, it, on, on, on near, <clears throat> uh, there's, there's some rules for, a for a deployment. Actually, that's a good question. Like, governance, like, what is, what is your thinking here? So, so we don't have, 
We didn't build any formal governance. Right. Uh, and the, the way uh, the way initially it will work is that I, I think it will work the same way as with any other chain. Mm -hmm. We will ship a new binary which has a version. Right. Uh, and on the protocol level, everybody can, can vote right. for the next version. Mm -hmm. and, 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 wait, uh, even that might not exist on the very first ver version. On the very first version, it could be like completely social consensus. So the voting is just signaling? So it's just signaling, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, to an extent. So, so the way I see it, and that might not exist on the first version, right? Mm -hmm. we, we're debating if we want to build it before or after mainnet. But the way I see it is that uh, the approvals in the block, they include the version, the, the highest version you can speak. And on the epoch boundary, the versions which can automatically happen if, uh, if, if sufficient percentage of, of the block producers do speak the new version. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so that, that, that is all uh, like at the, at the early stage of how it works. Okay. But there is no token vote mm -hmm. or anything. So, so it is token vote to an extent, <coughs> but it's token vote by block producers. They're effectively saying we, we want, we're ready to use the new one. Uh -huh. But right. governance in terms of like who creates a spec, who creates an implementation, at the beginning it's going to be us. Mm -hmm. uh, we call it like the, the reference maintainer or whatnot. Right. Uh, and if we go rogue, people, people can always say like, okay, let's not use theirs the anymore. Right. Let, let's hard fork. Like the, sa the, same, the same governance that has been working for the last, how many now, 11 right. years. I mean, even Bitcoin has been using this signaling mechanism. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah so si signaling, mm -hmm. the only question is like, do we want to build it in now or, or, or later? Right. Um, actually, going back to the WASM stuff. So you said there was these promises. Mm -hmm. like. Um, what, how, how fast do these promises return? So effectively, let, let's say chunks are never skipped. So every block has all the chunks. Yeah. So what will happen is uh, on height seven, Alice creates a block, mm -hmm. uh, which includes the, the promise from six. Right. Right. On height seven, when Dylan receives uh, their part, they will already execute on the promise. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and so, so, so like eff effectively, so it's like a one one slot duration. So 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 one slot to get to seven, and then one slot to get back to eight. Okay. So so if everything goes very well, if there's no congestion and chunks are not skipped, uh, then something that initiated in six will hear back in eight. Okay, but then what what, what if you you know with reasonably high probability that um, you know the two contracts are going to be in the same shard? Mm -hmm. Do you get faster than? To so do they know? Okay, so that's a huge trade-off, right? Yeah, so, so, so it's a trade-off. Uh, I, I think the biggest reason why we did that is that we don't want people to grind, right? right. Be because like, uh, what you will end up having is you will have one smart contract which everybody needs. And then they want to be close to it. And everybody will want to be in that shard, right? And even with resharding. So without resharding, you're guaranteed to have everybody in that shard. Because like I mean, in a way, it's yeah. proof of work. It's like meritocracy. It's, it's, not, it's not a lot of proof of work. There's 100 shards. With the probability 1% every time you land in the shard you want to. So it takes you 100 attempts to deploy. No, but what I mean is like, if you want to be extra close so that the probability that you'll be separated is yeah. very, very low. Th that's with dynamic resharding. With, right, without with dynamic resharding, you oh, just, you yeah, just yeah, yeah. De deploy to I the I mean shard. with dynamic yeah. resharding, yeah. Yeah, with dynamic resharding you can get closer and closer, but it's still, uh, it's very undesirable right. property. So instead what happens is that uh, it gives you a little bit of an advantage to be in the same shard because you, you're guaranteed to be in the very next chunk uh, when that happens in the same shard. While between shards, like if the chunk is skipped, it's, ah, okay. it's more but of a still, delay. Okay, but still, you know, one second is much slower than, you know, instant. Yes, yeah. So, so at least at least today it is built this way. Okay. Uh, the second reason for that is that it's easier to implement everything consistently than special case the same shard. So here's my prediction of how near will evolve, mm -hmm. is that there will be like this one mega contract where you can do internal calls synchronously. Yeah, like a VM contract. Yeah, right? and yeah. then, and then that will be really, really big, and then, and then that will even break the the dynamic right. stuff, and so you'll have one shot with a very expensive. Yeah. But but if we see that happening, we can react, right? Like probably it will not happen overnight. So how would you react? Uh, well, at this point, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, but open we, problem. Okay. Right, but but you see, there are so many things that can go wrong. Yeah. We, we, we can spend time and, and address each of them, or we can launch and see what actually can go wrong uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and adjust as we go. And then we can learn from your mistakes. Well, yeah, the same way we learn from mistakes of others, right? Right, but you're one of the first movers, at least that's one of your goals, right? Uh, we want to be as early mover as possible. Right. It doesn't have to, like Cosmos is already first mover, you know, from, 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 from the right. series of blockchains that I follow closely. Right. Yeah. I mean, we kind of want to be last mover in the sense that, you know, we want to, you know, be the ones that are still there in 10 years. Um, 
Well, ev everybody <laughs> wants that. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Th th that's um, more of a philosophical question, whether you want to launch early or late to be, to be right. there in 10 years. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, so if I recall correctly, one of the things that you really care about is not only DevX, which you mentioned, mm -hmm. Uh, in passing, but also UX. Yeah, user experience. Um, so you, you, there's some innovations there. Can you talk about those? So, yeah. So, so, so I think like innovation would be a strong word. Many things we do exist in some way or another in the Ethereum ecosystem today. Mm -hmm. uh, they just exist as uh, independent projects, right? Uh, which not always work very well together. But I think over time that will all happen naturally. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are a few things. One thing is that uh, we allow. Um, so, so, so one thing is, is completely agnostic to the protocol. It's just something we, we have out of the box built, which is we have so-called hosted wallets. And, a hosted, so, and so one of them we're hosting ourselves. And a hosted wallet is a way for you to have, uh, to start using near without having to, to, to do anything with the blockchain. So specifically, uh, the four things we try to avoid is, A, we don't want people to understand key pairs. Yes. Uh, because it's not something that is easy to explain to people. Also, people lose private keys. Uh, B, we don't want people to install MetaMasks. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, there's three things. And C, we don't want people to, to, pay, to pay. Like, you don't have to buy near before you use something because buying crypto today is extremely complex. Right. Like, like, I don't know how in the rest of the world, but here I have to send my passport to the exchange. It's insane. Yes. Yeah. Right. And so if to buy a crypto kitty, I need to send my passport to someone, <laughs> like, the drop-off rate will be very high. Okay. Uh, the thing is that at least the first two things are necessary for you to get the security of the protocol. If you don't install MetaMask, if you just use a web page, the, the, the host of the web page can send you whatever code they want and steal your private key, even if it's in local storage. What, well, unless yeah. it's maybe an IPFS page or something. Unless, right, but someone is hosting that IPFS page. No, because, you know, you, you, you know, for example, the page could be hosted on an ENS domain, mm -hmm. and then, you know, you trust that basically there's like a fixed link yeah. to like- But, but someone I do trust. Right. Well, no, but the thing is that is like is like social trust at a very very high level. Yeah. In yep. the same way that I trust, you know, the near yeah. blockchain. Right. So so the idea here is the following. So the hosted wallet is this idea where there is a completely centralized server. Yeah. In this case, we run it. Yeah. Uh, which gives you gateway to all the to all the to all the applications running on near. Right. And so instead of installing MetaMask and coming coming up with a key pair, you will open this hosted wallet. Oh, this I hosted see. wallet has a different way to authenticate you. So it will, it will be a, uh, like a login and password mm. or like something along the lines. Or like the way we do it today is you will create an account uh, and we will store the key locally in the local storage. Uh, but we're also going to store the key on our end. Uh, so one thing we need to cover is we have a concept of an access key. So the account is not defined by a single key. Account is defined by a name. The ENS is sort of embedded in the system. Uh, and the account can have arbitrary number of keys associated with it, and those keys can have different permissions, right? And so near keeps a key on its side, which is sufficient to uh, to initiate the account recovery. And so, so today that key technically can recover account and use it the way it wants, but the way to improve it, for example, would be that that key can initiate account recovery, which will only happen seven days from that moment. Right, you like know? Argent or something. Yes, so, yeah. So, yeah, so so that's something that exists, right? Uh, and so what happens now is that near has that key, uh, that, that, that allows to recover. And so when you use hosted wallet, you can provide your phone number or your email, and so you have recovery options. Right. So if you do lose your key locally, you can recover it using the mm -hmm. means you used to. Mm -hmm. uh, but obviously, you completely trust Nier at this point, at least to a very large extent. Because even, even if that key has seven-day uh, delay, right. because you're using the Nier web, website, to the next time you go to you. that website, it just yeah. sends you JavaScript, which extracts the key from the local storage, sends it to Nier. Right. So, so there's a, a lot of trust in near. Right. But if all you do is you buy a crypto <coughs> kitty which, which is worth 10 cents, that's perfectly fine. Like near will not, right. you know, go, go against you to steal a 10 cents crypto kitty. Right. Uh, and so, what, but because we have access keys uh, and the account is not defined by the key, at the moment when you actually have valuable assets, at that point you can, uh, you can create your own account, like you can install MetaMask or, or like whatever the, the plugin or the wallet you want to use, you install it, you create a key which is now local to you. Nobody has access to it, and then the last transaction that you that, that you trust near to perform right. is to is to bring that key and remove near key. At which point you have full control over the account. Near has no access to it anymore, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and what is and it's way easier in Ethereum if if you need to transfer access to the account from one key to another, the only way to do that is to create another account and transfer all the assets. 
Mm -hmm. If some of them are locked or not transferable, uh, then you cannot do that at all, right? If your key was compromised. Well, right? in theory, you could build a functionality. But yeah, yeah. Uh, but but in this case, because because every account has access keys, right? Uh, you, you maintain the same account. You just change the key. Right. So so it simplifies. Uh -huh. Like Argent, Argent has built Argent on Ethereum, so it is clearly right. possible, right? Right. But it's harder. Right. Uh, and yeah, and then uh, while in near it's very easy to build such a hosted wallet. So in expectation, there's going to be near hosted wallet, but there are going to be others. Right. Uh, so whichever one you trust, you use that to start. Uh, and also the hosted wallet can choose to pay for your fees. Uh -huh. So like, right. we, like we have a strong incentive to pay for your fees because we want people to use near. Right. Right. And you have lots of tokens. And, and yeah, we have we have tokens, right? So so we have an incentive. But someone else. Like for example, it could be an application-specific gateway, which pays for your fees because they want they have future value in you. Like hypothetical crypto right. kitties yeah, yeah. will build a hosted wallet. They will pay for your fees initially yeah. because, You're like an expectation, you will buy a ten thousand dollar crypto kitty covering fees for you know. Okay, so let's talk about this ten thousand dollar crypto kitty. You're saying that you can solve the passport problem. Mm -hmm. Are, does it mean that you're gonna become like a, the, a broker where you're gonna sell near tokens and you're not gonna ask for passports? The, the expectation is that a, uh, if if people get sufficiently bought into some product, uh, but but also there's wire, there are others, right? So we we will we we like the hope is to integrate with those people. Like we, we don't want to be broker ourselves. Right. It's completely orthogonal to what we're building. Right. But uh, but but like someone who figured it out for Ethereum, uh, they not attached to a particular blockchain as as long as. Near token is treated the same way as Ethereum token from perspective of particular jurisdiction. Right. Th their solution will work for any blockchain. Okay, I see. So basically, you, you, you're taking, as you said at the beginning, different solutions from Ethereum mm -hmm. and then putting them all in a central solution. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, so, some of them we will put into central solution, and we will try to integrate with those who who we cannot replace ourselves. Yeah. But but the the idea is that on on Ethereum that. Today there are steps towards very good UX, but they they far from from converging, uh, and they and they just joined, and so we're just saying, well, let's have one combined solution right. which works, right? Right. So 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 I I wouldn't say that this is like a huge innovation. Uh, it just in, in UX <coughs> it's not innovation. It's just it's convenience that that matters. Right. Okay. I mean, there's there's a few things that I that that we could talk about, but. Um... Is there anything in particular that you'd like to highlight before we wrap up? No, I, th I think we covered so much. Yeah, yeah more, more than I was expecting. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you for participating. Yeah. Cool. And, uh, cool.